from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you, and here's what's coming up. K-State's Dan O'Brien will look at the pre-report estimates ahead of that USDA planting intentions report coming out next Tuesday. And Dan comments on grain sorghum export business that is giving an apparent boost to local grain sorghum prices in Kansas. That during his weekly segment on the grain market trends next. Also today from the NRCS, Ethan Walker will go over the five principles of soil health and how the utilization of cover crops serves each of those purposes individually. This from a presentation he was to make at a K-State Field Day in southeast Kansas. And later on, on Kansas Agricultural Weather, K-State's Mary Knapp. Plus more, straight ahead on Agriculture Today. Make hand washing a healthy habit everywhere you go. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after going to the bathroom, before, during, and after preparing food, and before eating. If soap and water aren't available, use a hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol. Life is better with clean hands. A message from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. This is the K-State Radio Network. Thanks for listening to another Agriculture Today. On the grain markets, Dan O'Brien is standing by to offer his latest input, grain market economist, K-State Research and Extension. It's, of course, been another whirlwind of a week, Dan. We'll talk about that, but let's look ahead, if we might. This coming Tuesday is a crop production report that is usually eagerly anticipated. It's probably being overshadowed by the influences of COVID-19, but that's the planting intentions report. And what are you hearing about the expectations? Well, what it's a it's a different story, I think, between what what you hear from uh, the trade, which is which are the official numbers that came out here in the last year or so, and the concerns that you hear from from farmers as they wonder about which crops will cash flow, et cetera. The straight up trade numbers are, uh, as came out in a Bloomberg report survey released yesterday, corn expectations for about something in the range of 92 to 96 million. So there's a fair amount of, of variability there. Uh, average estimate about 94, 94, 95 is what the USDA had said uh, in its outlook conference in February. So uh, 92 to 96 for soybeans, 82.7 to 87.5 million acres. So again, big swing. Uh, average estimate about 85. Cotton numbers, 11 to 13.6. An estimate, of, average estimate of 12.4. Sorghum, pretty important to us here in Kansas and in, in the central and southern plains, 5.8 million acres, range of 5.4 to 6.5. And then you have other crops too. So the thing that I wonder about, Eric, is that this this survey was taken on the 1st of March mm-hmm. and represented what people were thinking at that time. Well, an awful lot has happened since that time. And a lot of the uh, the issues having to do with the ethanol industry here in the United States uh, have come to bear since then. Uh, we were percolating along pretty well, really, and you know, not gangbusters, but doing decently for ethanol well since then. You know, we're looking at plant closures with the way the coronavirus has come in and affected the economy. So uh, there's some question about what that would do to corn plantings if farmers start to get uh, worried about about the corn market. Uh, also, since that time, we've seen uh, some dry conditions come on in Brazil. That's affected their second crop corn plantings and and some tail end harvesting of for soybeans. Also, Argentina as a coronavirus issues that's affected their economy. They're in quote shutdown. So both of those countries having major issues dealing with the coronavirus. And just just reading some of, of what you hear of what's going on in Brazil in terms of unrest about different discussions of measures, whether they should take off uh, you know their slowdowns that they've had to avoid this disease or not. It just it can't help logistics to happen right. to happen smoothly. So in light of that, U.S. soybean exports have been looking up. 
again, we have our own issues for sure, but so far our, our flow of grain hasn't been affected as much. So you've got that happening and uh, issues in the world wheat market. And I think some of that has to do with, yes, some dry conditions and other issues in Eastern Europe, Black Sea region affected, but a tendency now, almost in kind of a something akin to uh, some proportion of like the big rice panic that happened in the middle 1886, 87, where countries start to get scared and they start to hold back their supplies. Mm -hmm. So you've got some of the, all this stuff happening. And our initial reaction on these markets were that, gosh, everything's going to heck in a handbasket. But after we've come out of that, we're seeing that, well, this is, there's a lot of countries thinking that, and it's probably created some really unexpected opportunities for different of these crops. It's hurt corn for sure, but uh, you know, arguably, as we've seen exports for grain sorghum move to the higher side, that's part of the of a issue of uh, China's response to their own domestic crops. Dan, expand, if you would, for a second here on grain sorghum movement in the export channels. You think that's being reflected very clearly in the basis changes we see at Kansas delivery points. And it's a rather enthusing note amidst all of the other that's going on out there these days. Well, you know, grain sorghum was the first commodity that took a hit. Uh, with regard to the U.S.-China trade issues. And now uh, uh, it's really interesting that the, the first commodity that's really starting to see some, some benefit or amongst the first ones, along with soybeans, uh, out, out of this seems to be grain sorghum. We've got uh, some buying that's happened. If you watch the uh, USDA Foreign Ag Service reports, there's been about a 20 million bushel increase in forward purchases of grain sorghum in the last one or two weeks, a jump. If you look at uh, Central Kansas Bed, you've got some locations, Concordia and uh, Salina, Hutchinson, Great Bend, where you, you're seeing basis move to the higher side just within the last one or two days. And even in Western Kansas, you get you have some locations where grain sorghum basis up 10 cents, up 13 to 15, depending on which communities you're looking at. Not everywhere, but where you're seeing that is at the elevators that they're probably tied in more with export prospects. So I, I guess I'd, I'd say that it's a good time for the sake of grain sorghum, given the travails of the ethanol industry right now, for grain sorghum to regain some export strength. And probably, probably a lot of that's probably coming from, from uh, China again. The issue with China, in the last few days, there, you hear announcements that, that they're concerned about their corn stockpiles being whittled down. And, uh, you know, these things don't happen in a vacuum. If they're concerned with that, you wonder if some of the same factors that were encouraging U.S. grain sorghum exports to China before are perhaps coming back into play. Dan, I want to touch upon something here that you've observed, you say, of late, and you've been quite interested in how speculative trading in the grain markets has been behaving amidst the coronavirus situation. And you say that you're finding more stability there than you had originally anticipated. Well, we've got Commodity Futures Trading Commission Commitment of Traders data up through the 17th of March. And on Friday, they'll be releasing the next uh, set of numbers that'll cover through the 24th. It's going to be really interesting <laughs> to see what happened, uh, especially to speculative traders in that time frame. Up to that time, even with prices moving lower, you really, for corn, for hard red winter wheat, soybeans, you hadn't seen the spec traders just go bearish completely. Now, I suspect that you may have seen that from the 17th to the 24th, but, but since that time, you know, uh, just as we've talked about wheat, soybeans, moving a little bit to the higher side, probably the, the place where, where uh, you, you wonder what, what the futures markets had done will be on corn futures to see how, how that's played out. And uh, corn futures, uh, the corn market's in a conundrum. Uh, there's no segment of our ag complex that would benefit more than a quick economic recovery and fuel to move higher and all of that than the corn market, given our dependence on ethanol. Yeah. Last thought here, amidst, again, all of the uncertainty, we haven't escaped that whatsoever. Producers would understandably be fairly skittish about uh, making significant market moves at this point. But what would you say to producers who feel compelled to say, do something about old crop at this point? I would not get hunkered down and go to sleep. You know, we're seeing some 
really surprising moves in soybeans and, and uh, old crop wheat. And, and some of this is happening because what's happening overseas. It's not just us that's been affected by the coronavirus, but other places have been too. And some of their distribution systems have been slowed down, South America in particular. So, uh, you know, in times of great stress like this, it's just interesting how how with the demand for, for bread, that's affected the wheat market. And it's probably not just our wheat market. It's probably the whole, the whole world's wheat market and more desire to get more than adequate supplies. So I, I would not go to sleep on these things. If you're at, uh, in the corn market, like I say, we're so dependent on, on the strength of the economy that we'll just have to wait and see. But uh, here for grain sorghum, for soybeans, for hard red winter wheat, there's some positive things happening. We just, I think uh, when everybody else is, is gloomy, hey, there's some things happening <laughs> that we need to not, not go to sleep on. All right. And we do want to squeeze in one last thing here. Your department, Agricultural Economics at K-State, just last evening started off a series of what they're calling online gatherings on the economics of agriculture during the COVID-19 pandemic. And you will be up to bat next in that series this coming Thursday, talking about the grain markets and planting intentions. You're hoping that'll be an interactive opportunity for those who choose to participate, Dan. Yeah, the, the plan is for uh, we'll we'll start out those hour long sessions with about fifteen twenty minutes of of what we see in the markets and and uh, you know some supporting in- information that people have access to uh, either through Ag Manager or, or or and they'll see it on the screen. But then our intention is to uh, stand back and and uh, bring in the discussion of what goes on. I know uh, for that session, I've talked with Greg Ivendahl in our shop, and he'll also be looking at some updated cost production figures to look at as well. So that's taking place this coming Thursday, April the 2nd, 7 o'clock in the evening. All the particulars of being part of that are found on agmanager.info. As are Dan's notes this week on the grain markets. Dan, thank you as always. Next week, we'll get together again. Thank you, Eric. Take care. Dan O'Brien, Grain Market Economist, K-State Research and Extension, and we'll have more for you after this. This is Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. You're tuned to Agriculture Today. Welcome back. Well, the COVID-19 disruptions are far-reaching, to put it mildly. For instance, K-State's full slate of spring field days for you producers have been put on the shelf. So, as an alternative, in the weeks ahead, we'll be inviting onto the broadcast here would-be presenters at many of these field days to share their information in this venue, including what we have for you right here. One of the scheduled topics at K-State's Cover Crops Soil Health Field Day, which was set for late April in southeast Kansas, on cover crops and how they contribute to soil health. We're joined now by Ethan Walker. Ethan is a rangeland health specialist with the Natural Resources Conservation Service office in Montgomery County, southeast Kansas. Ethan, welcome to you. We understand you're actually out in the field as we speak, conducting your normal NRCS work. So we appreciate you taking a few moments aside to talk with us. What we'll do here is focus on what are very well defined as the five principles of soil health. You might, before we get into those particularly, explain how these were derived. Yeah, so the five principles of soil health were really a combination of what makes soil healthy. So soil, unlike unconventional wisdom, you know, you think it's just a medium to grow plants, but it's actually a living ecosystem. So in creating these, uh, these are really five components on how to promote a living ecosystem. 
And let's talk about cover crops, how they might contribute to those principles. The first of them is called soil armor. What does that refer to? Yeah, so soil armor or the residue of the soil is really important for the regulation of soil temperature. Just like us, um, we have skin to protect us. The soil has residue to protect all the little critters living down in that soil. So um, residue, it does help with temperature management. Uh, It also decreases plant pest pressure. And so when you're thinking about residue, um, if you don't have enough residue, maybe adding a cover crop such as cereal rye and then using that as a way to decrease that next year's weed pressure. So if you're looking at this aspect of soil armor, protecting the soil biology, if you will, do you want to be somewhat specific about the selection of your cover crop species for density of cover, that sort of thing? Yeah, it goes into the carbon-nitrogen ratio or C-to-N ratio. So if you're wanting a longer-lasting residue, you want to pick a cover crop that has a higher C-to-N ratio, which means it'll take longer to break down. Something like legumes or clovers has a very low C-to-N ratio. So if your objective was to have a high residue result, you would not choose something that's high in legumes. You'd want something high in, say, a cereal rye or oats with a high seed in ratio. The second principle, minimizing soil disturbance. Well, that's something the NRCS has talked up ever since the inception of the agency. But we need to be more specific here about what kinds of disturbance. Yeah, so it's not just physical disturbance, such as tillage. It's also biological disturbance and chemical disturbance. So you can actually disrupt the ecosystem by adding too much chemical to that field, such as uh, fertilizer or pesticide. So to compensate for that, will a cover crop help in that cause? Right, and that can go back to, say, such as the residue to reduce the weed pressure. Um, If you're adding that residue and you have a lower weed pressure, then in return, you will have a lower chemical cost to control those weeds, which will save you money in the long run. The third principle of the five, well, you can see very readily where cover crops would fit this, plant diversity, and how that promotes soil health. And you might speak to that very principle itself, how how diversity of plant species does, in fact, directly impact the healthiness and the well-being of that soil. Absolutely. So a monoculture crop will typically result in a monoculture ecosystem down in the soil, which after a while we can start to get uh, some pest pressure, such as nematodes. Uh, When you start adding diversity to that, you will get a diverse compounds that are excreted from those cover crops And those actually invite um, other hosts, other predators, and you start controlling that predator-prey relationship to hopefully control that nematode problem if you have it. So um, not just adding a single cover crop, but have at least a, a grass, a legume, and a brassica, such as tillage radish or rapeseed, will be beneficial as well. And this is within the overall structure of a crop rotation. That's very important in all of this. Right. So on a typical corn bean rotation, there's not much diversity in there. So that does include the cash crop rotation as well. So obviously adding some winter wheat in there does help, but maybe mixing it up a bit and adding a summer crop such as sunflower or canola in that rotation will be beneficial as well. All right. Well, the fourth of the five principles, this is really where cover crops can suit the need of uh, soil improvement. It's continual live plant root interaction. You might explain that. That has a, a lot to do with carbon 
movement into the soil. Yeah, so we have to feed all that biology that's underneath the ground. And carbon is our main food source. So in a field that's fallow, all those organisms aren't getting food and they have the potential to die out. So adding a root system, having something to feed organisms, carbon, as long as possible, uh, will keep that ecosystem functioning uh, as long as possible. So this allows that uh, process to continue as a substitute for the dormant period of a crop rotation. That's where the cover crop serves a purpose here. Correct. Instead of having a fallow period in between crops and a lot of the microbiology in the ground slowing or stopping completely, you'll feed that system continually during that fallow period in between crops. And the last of the five principles, as we're moving right through these very rapidly, livestock integration. And you might explain why returning livestock to a given field would serve a a soil health purpose here. Yeah, for one, it is a good economical decision for your pocketbook. So while that field is sitting fallow, uh, you can actually get some extra income by grazing that cover crop. Uh, And then also it has an improvement with the nutrient cycle. So those cattle or species who will graze that cover crop and it will cycle those nutrients back into the ground. And a lot of times those nutrients will be plant available, which will increase or speed up that cycle, making it plant available again. So, Ethan, when you put all of this together, one comes up with a pretty good recipe for improving soil health. And that's been proven over and over again, you say, as we've seen more cover crop adoption here in the state of Kansas. Right. Uh, It's not just no-till. So we need to take it to the next step and include cover crops with no-till to really get all the benefits of soil health inputs will start to decrease, yields will potentially increase, they won't go down, and you'll start seeing profitability increase due to your lower input cost of chemical, fertilizer, and things like that. And lastly, one presumes that the NRCS has collected a wealth of information on cover crops and soil health that could be shared with producers. Yeah, uh, NRCS is making a really big effort to help producers uh, and financially assist producers. So that could be an introduction to no-till or uh, helping them financially pay for cover crops as well. So I definitely recommend someone that's interested to visit their local NRCS office and see what could be offered to them. Or at least make contact with that office, given the situation (laughs) of the day. (laughs) That's very true, very true. Very well. Well, we appreciate, Ethan, you passing along these guidelines on cover crop utilization as they would apply to soil health. Many thanks for your time right here. Yep, thank you for having me. That's Ethan Walker from the NRCS office in Montgomery County in southeast Kansas again. Ethan was slated to speak on soil health improvement via cover crop production at K-State's Cover Crop Soil Health Field Day, which would have taken place in April. And we'll have more for you shortly on this Agriculture Today. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus, so if you have a fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going in. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Agriculture Today continues on the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson with you. Now, today's agricultural news headlines, these courtesy in part of DTN. 
Well, in response to COVID-19, the Kansas Department of Health and Environment and the Kansas Department of Agriculture are strongly encouraging all landowners and pasture managers to voluntarily reduce the number of acres they intend to burn this spring. With the potential for the pandemic overwhelming the state's medical facilities, any additional respiratory concerns that could be produced from breathing smoke from prescribed fire need to be mitigated. Those the words of KDHE Secretary Dr. Lee Norman, who went on to say with the resources of the county emergency response staffs already being taxed with COVID-19 response, it's important to minimize responses that would come from prescribed fire activity. Land managers in areas included in the smoke model available online at ksfire.org should consult the model if they do choose to burn. That model indicates the level at which a burn would contribute to urban area air quality problems. Secretary of Agriculture Mike Beam is urging land managers to refrain from burning, especially if one's area is predicted in the large red contribution range on that smoke model. Mike adding that this request should not be interpreted as an indictment of the practice of burning. He went on to say the circumstances, however, surrounding the coronavirus pandemic have created a situation that calls for reduced burned acres this spring. The U.S. State Department and Department of Homeland Security have decided to authorize temporary waivers for in-person interviews for eligible H-2 visa applicants. This applies to both H-2A and H-2B visas. Temporarily waiving in-person interviews for those visa applicants streamlines the application process and helps provide steady labor for the agriculture sector during this time of uncertainty. Those are the words of USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue. It is not clear if the State Department actions apply only to returning visa holders or if the process will help seed the new visa applicants. And the USDA should use its Section 32 authority to purchase additional dairy products in a bid to support the struggling dairy industry and meet rising food assistance needs as the nation grapples with COVID-19. That's according to Vermont's congressional delegation in a letter they sent this week to Secretary Perdue. The coronavirus hitting the U.S. dairy industry hard and the National Milk Producers Federation is looking to the USDA to help stabilize prices and provide aid to struggling farmers, a key issue in the dairy industry. The uh, Relating to the level of school closures that have taken place, reducing milk demand, and that may well be demand that will be lost for the sector. The USDA has approved General Conservation Reserve Program sign-up and will begin notifying qualifying producers next week. Here's more on that from the USDA's Stephanie Ho. USDA has selected more than 3 million acres for General Conservation Reserve Program sign-up. We were able to accept 3.4 million acres from the General CRP sign-up. That was 89% of the offers that were submitted. That was Farm Service Agency Administrator Richard Fordyce. This is the first opportunity that landowners have had to participate in a general sign-up since 2016. That sign-up, very few acres were accepted, so we were excited. He says there weren't many acres accepted last time because USDA was already close to a congressionally set acreage cap. A number of acres are expiring in this fiscal year, so we knew we had some room under the cap because of the expiring acres and also the Farm Bill allowed Allowing for a cap increase incrementally over the life of the farm bill. So we knew that we had space. Producers with accepted offers will be notified next week. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Next up for you on Agriculture Today, this week's Kansas Wheat Scoop. We turn it on over now to Marsha Boswell. Marsha? March is Bake and Take Month. Each year in March, we encourage you to bake a plate of cookies or a cake or a loaf of bread and take it to a friend, neighbor, or relative. The highlight of this is when you take time to visit with them when you drop off the treat you made. Obviously, this year we cannot encourage these visits. We are staying at home, physically social distancing ourselves from even our closest friends and relatives. Like so many people, I am working from home. I am one of the lucky ones who is able to continue working connecting with colleagues across the country. Many of our neighbors have lost their jobs, don't know where their meals are coming from, 
or don't know how they're going to pay their rent this month. Last night, while I was rummaging through my new home office desk, I ran across a file labeled Letters from Home. Inside this file are a number of letters that I received from home during my first year of college. Many of them were handwritten. Some included coloring sheets and pictures that my younger sisters had sent me during that first year when I was no longer at home. The one thing they all had in common was that I have saved them for 24 years. We don't write handwritten letters much anymore, but the ones we have are special. During these unprecedented times, why not write a handwritten note to include with your baked treat and drop it off on a neighbor's doorstep? You could even have your kids draw a picture to accompany the note and treat. We have some time right now to spend with our children baking. Let's bake with them and share those treats with somebody who possibly doesn't have children at home. There are so many people who live alone who would welcome a care package. Bake and Take began in 1970 as a community service project of the Kansas Weed Hearts. The Weed Hearts set out to share baked goods with family members, friends, neighbors, and those in need, generating goodwill in the community. While the purpose of Bake and Take Month is to encourage participants to bake a product made from wheat and take it to a neighbor, friend, or relative, the personal visit to members of the community has become as rewarding and important as the baked goods you take them. This year, let's consider celebrating this 50-year tradition in a new way, with a baked treat and a handwritten note. You never know, once you get a chance to visit your neighbors in person, you may see your child's drawing posted on the refrigerator, reminding them daily of the special gift you gave. If you're looking for recipe ideas, check out the delicious and well-tested bread recipes at nationalfestivalofbreads.com and all the treat and dinner recipes at eatwheat.org. As always, it's especially important to follow food safety recommendations and wash your hands before, during, and after baking. Resources are available at homebaking.org. And be sure to share your stories with us at facebook.com slash Kansas Wheat. For Kansas Wheat, I'm Marsha Boswell. Thanks, Marsha. A quick reminder here about catching this broadcast on demand anytime you'd like via our podcast service to access that agtoday.net agtoday.net and we'll return with more on agriculture today did you know every kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people kansas farmers are hard workers dependable authentic and sensitive not only do farmers put food on your table but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car for more information about kansas farmers visit k-state research and extension online or stop by your local extension office This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Now on Agriculture Today, our time set aside each week to take a look at Kansas agricultural weather with Mary Knapp along with us, climatologist with K-State Research and Extension, as you know, joining us from the Weather Data Library here at the university. Well, what we've seen in the weather around Kansas this week would have to be considered commonplace for a Kansas spring, Mary. Yes, it has. It's uh, been very much within the bounds of our normal spring precipitation and temperature. Actually, we have been cooler than normal for the week ending on March 24th. Statewide, the average is about a degree cooler than normal. And again, given the range that we can have, that's almost normal. The southwest was the warm spot. They averaged a degree warmer than normal. They also had the high. We hit 79 degrees on the 20th. And they didn't quite make the low. The low was in the northwest. It hit 15 degrees on the 20th. The northwest ran about two degrees cooler than normal. As far as precipitation, we had a statewide average of seven-tenths of an inch, which is about one and a third times what we would normally see for the week. But as we've seen over much of the winter, there was a very steep divide on that moisture. Basically, if you draw a line from south-central Kansas to northeast Kansas, anything South and east of that line had above normal, with the southeast really taking the cake. They averaged 2.28 inches, 
which is about three times their normal, and that produced some flooding uh, in that southeast corner. The northwest was the driest division. They averaged only a tenth of an inch, which is just about a third of what they would typically see during the week. So again, we've noted there was quite a sharp divide in who got it and who didn't get it. On that topic of flooding, southeast Kansas anticipated this for this spring, and it's starting to head in that direction. You'll be putting out an article in the forthcoming e-update to be posted later this afternoon, Mary, on the spring flooding outlook for Kansas. Right. Um, We will cover both what were the antecedent conditions and how that sets the stage for the potential for that flood. And we also have an outlook on what kind of precipitation might occur. And of course, we note in that article, even areas that are on the dry side now, if you get one of those thunderstorms, such as we saw last night, you can have localized flooding just from the downpour in a short period of time of some fairly heavy rains. Be looking for that in the e-update newsletter out of K-State Agronomy later on today at agronomy.ksu.edu. Presumably, though, the drought monitor in the broad sense hasn't changed much out of all of this. No, it hasn't. Um, In the Northwest, while it was drier, in fact, much drier than normal, um, the colder than normal temperatures and the fact that The vegetation hasn't progressed as much as in the rest of the state has lessened some of the evaporative demand. And so it's still in that abnormally dry state. We're watching that and looking at um, how it fares with the rains that we're expecting over the weekend. Um, It won't take much to push it into a more severe drought category, given the fact that we're now ramping up into our heavier rain season. In the southwest, they did see some moisture, not quite what they would expect, but again, not quite enough to push it deeper into the drought. We still have some moderate and severe drought in that southwest corner of the state. Well, what are the details on the weather system that is going to be setting up in Kansas over the weekend? Perhaps the chance for severe weather, Mary? Right. As we deal with these spring systems, that chance for severe weather is always there. More likely to be hail and wind rather than tornadoes, although there is a slight risk for tornadic activity with the system. What we're looking for on precipitation amounts, again, in that southwest corner, they may see as much as a half an inch, but again, it ranges between a quarter and a half an inch for most of the state. You get down to Elkhart, and they're more in the tenth to a quarter amount. Move over into central and south central Kansas, the amounts get a little bit heavier with a half to three quarters of an inch expected. Interestingly enough, the northwest corner is favored to see as much as maybe an inch and a half, as is uh, parts of east central and southeastern Kansas. Of note on that is that inch and a half in northwest would be well above what they would typically see, while in the east central and southeast, it's only going to be slightly more than their normal for a week's worth of moisture at this time of year. And if we look a tad further then, getting into the month of April more deeply, what uh, does it look like in the way of precipitation and temperatures, which uh, could stand to warm a bit here and there? Right. Well, if we look at the month of April as a whole, the outlook for temperatures is neutral. It's equally likely to be above or below normal. As far as moisture goes, there is a pattern that they expect above normal moisture, or at least the chance for above normal moisture, across the northern half of Kansas. The southern part of the state is equally likely to be wetter or drier than normal. If we look at a little bit shorter time frame and look at the next 8 to 14 days, which carries us through the 9th of April, we're favoring cooler than normal temperatures on the eastern half of the state and or eastern third right along the Missouri border. 
warmer than normal for the west and neutral in the central. As far as the moisture, again, it's intriguing. They're favoring a drier pattern along the eastern edge of the state, but they're favoring a wetter than normal pattern in the southwest corner of the state. And that would actually be very favorable. We could use some dry down in the east, and if we could squeeze out some extra moisture in that southwest, again, it would be a very promising pattern. Mary, as always, many thanks. We'll catch up with you again next Friday. Thanks, Eric. She reports on Kansas agricultural weather each week right here. Mary Knapp, climatologist with K-State Research and Extension. And thanks to you as well for being along with us. Please rejoin us right here on Monday. Until then, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.